screen there instead of counting down when we're really going to start. Uh, in case you're, in case you didn't know this was happening, um, I'm going to be doing with Brooke Miller uh, a little webinar tonight on how to do a live stream concert, basically. Um, but it's applicable to any live stream, you know, so music or gaming, or if you just want to give a lecture or talk to people about stuff, but you want it to look and sound a bit better than just, you know, holding your phone up in front of your face. Um, that's what we're talking about. So anyway, we're going live in just a minute. I'm going to check my settings here while people are gathering in front of the fire here. I've got two of three. Here we go. And you'll hear Brooke, of course, talking off camera. She's here with me. And, and there's Celso. There's Celso the dog. <laughs> oh, Celso. I can't seem to watch I have to apparently it's only telling me to watch this in the app on my on the do you have the app on your phone no nope. oh, okay which one is it is it uh your channel or my channel or my channel okay um and on the computer you have oh you've got youtube there YouTube. and you've got you've got my facebook there <clears throat> okay i can put your your facebook up on this screen yeah I'll let you do that sure Going to be starting our stream webinar in just a couple of minutes, folks. Probably a good idea. We'll just uh, keep the dog from making peanut gallery suggestions here. I'm gonna put him upstairs. Anytime he sees anything out the window, it's gonna make an editorial comment. Brooke, you can see that's that's your Facebook page on the big screen there. I can't really read it, but are you cool? I, I can, yeah. I'm taking a relaying look. stuff from there. Sure. Hi, Ryan Alexander. Hi, Christoph okay. in Austria on Brooke's page. How you doing? <laughs> there you go. Wow, Austria. So it's late for you. Let's mm -hmm. see what time is it early. It's 8 o'clock here, so you know, it's 1 in the morning. Oof. Wow. Well, you know, good on you. <laughs> okay, our countdown is done by the looks of it. And we're going to start tonight's webinar. All right. So um, tonight's webinar is sponsored by the Fountain School of uh, Performing Arts at Dalhousie University here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, my name is Don Ross, and I'm joined by Brooke Miller, who's off camera. She's uh, doing a lot of technical stuff tonight, and she's going to be uh, watching people's comments and questions as well. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, there she is. So we're going to do our best to keep an eye on your comments and questions, um, but there's m multiple pages that this is uh, streaming to, so it's a little challenging. But basically what I'm going to do is um, I I'll, I'll lead tonight for the most part, and uh, I've made some notes about sort of what I've discovered in terms of how to stream well on the internet. Now, um, that said, I still think that the streams that I put together are relatively simple, but what I've tried to do is I've tried to up my game a little bit in a few 
uh, ways. Namely, I've tried to make the stream look and sound decent. Um, now tonight, um, I'm sort of I'm going to try two cameras tonight. That's the first time I've actually done that. So right now, I'm just using the webcam on my laptop. And then uh, in a little while, Brooke is going to use a handheld um, HD camera for some uh, demo that I'm going to show uh, here in the studio. So you'll see the quality difference right away. Um, most webcams on pretty much any uh, laptop, especially, or any device that you might stream on, they're at best a 720p camera. So what that means is they're really set up to only have 720 pixels in one of the dimensions in the short dimension, um, the one along the side. Um, and what that means is the resolution is relatively low. I mean, it's fine for doing Facebook or Zoom or, I mean, sorry, not Facebook, FaceTime or Zoom or Skype, that kind of thing. And I've certainly given hundreds of guitar <laughs> lessons to people, especially on Skype, over the years on a 720p webcam. Now, I've heard that Apple's latest laptops that are coming out this year will have 1080p webcams on them. And I'm sure that was probably planned already in the pipeline a couple of years ago, but it's very appropriate and very timely given the age that we're in where we have much less opportunity to actually interact in person. So the better quality camera gives us a chance to interact online like we've been having to do an awful lot the last six months in much higher quality and with much better resolution in the picture quality. So that's great. Now the other aspect is the sound quality and we'll talk about that as well. Now, uh, on it to be frank, to be brutal, uh, when live streaming concerts started, especially uh, you know, Facebook Live, that kind of thing, I, I thought it was great that people had come up with an alternative to actually doing live shows because it wasn't safe to perform with an audience anymore. But the problem I had for the most part was that the quality of the streams was so low and I would find that I would tune in even to a friend's concert and very often I found it difficult to watch and listen only because the resolution of the video is so low and the sound quality was so poor. So uh, what I decided that it was that I would just kind of avoid streaming altogether. But then what, what happened was I started getting invitations to do live streaming concerts myself. And I thought, okay, well, uh, that might be trouble unless I learn a little bit about how to stream a concert well. Now, in my personal case, I have had willy-nilly to become very adept with technology, with all everything to do with computers. Um, Modern-day musicians, especially DIY musicians such as myself and a lot of us, have had to become our own, not only composers, performers, tour bookers, <laughs> managers, all that kind of stuff, but also do our own recordings and our own marketing and all that kind of stuff. So starting about 15 years ago, I, I, well, even longer ago now, 17 years ago, I really delved deep into home recording and I got myself a decent computer and a decent sound interface and some good microphones. And since the early 2000s, I've been making all my recordings at home. All the CDs that people have been buying since then or all the music that you hear streaming that was recorded any time after the year 2000 has all been done in my home studio. And I've moved a few times, so I've taken all the gear with me. And um, so my current setup here is where we live just outside of Halifax, Nova Scotia. And it's a cute little room I have in the house. And you can see there's some sound treatment on the walls uh, so that it helps deaden the sound a little bit, keeps the reflections down. And so if I record microphones, no problem. And what I've been doing a lot this year, I've actually been studying. I'm a master's degree student through the University of Chichester over in the UK. And they have an online partner called ThinkSpace Education. And they've got a fantastic program set up for orchestration. So I'm studying orchestration for music, film, and games. So it's a marriage of the skills that I have as a composer and an orchestrator, but also upping my game in terms of understanding how to do everything in a MIDI studio and using symphony, uh, sy symphonic libraries and things like that, and um, 
emulating the sounds of orchestras, but I can do it all myself. It's kind of crazy. And uh, if we have time later, I have a video queued up of my latest homework <laughs> that I could show you, uh, which has a really nice symphonic uh, soundtrack to it. So why don't we get into the sort of the meat and potatoes here, and uh, I'll talk for a few minutes. I'll try not to go too quickly, because I know that especially when it comes to things like gear and software, and uh, there's so much information that I could just blab out at you and, and have it go by really quickly, and then it would just be gone. Now, the good thing about this particular webinar, of course, is that it'll be archived. So all right, we're going to leave it up on, on YouTube and Facebook, um, you know, more or less permanently, so uh, people can always watch it whenever they need to. And so if there's something you don't get tonight, don't worry about it. You can always go back and watch it again, all right? So first off, um, I'm, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to show you, and what Brooke and I are going to do, is show you basically how to get yourself set up for the most basic setup. So for example, if you are a solo performer, this will mostly be geared to you. Now, what you can do is if you're not a solo performer, if you're a duo, a trio, a band, you can take this and basically upscale it. You can make it bigger by adding more people, more gear, more microphones, more all that kind of stuff, more connections to a mixing board, and essentially treat it the same way. So anything I say tonight is applicable to solo performers as well as bands. So you can uh, scale this up, right? So there's basically three things that we need to talk about. The first one is how to do your audio. The second is how to do your video. And the third is how do you hook that all up to software and broadcast that? Okay. So let's start with one thing at a time. <laughs> okay. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about what kind of camera to use that's best for this kind of thing, what kind of sound gear to use, and then there's a, a few different software options, and I've tried a couple of them, and I found them both useful. And the one I'm using tonight, I find even more useful than the one I started with. So I'll talk a bit about both. Um, so the most important things you need are, for example, when you do a live show, most of us, if we are a singer and a player, for example, will set up a vocal microphone and we'll plug our guitar in or, or, or put a microphone in front of our piano or wh whatever it is, whatever the, it is that we play. And then that in turn goes, of course, to a mixing desk that's usually run by an engineer. And that person balances your signals and sends it to a public address system and then everybody can hear you. And most of us who do this all the time have gotten really used to what gear we need. So if you are like, like myself, or I'll just take myself as an example, I play guitar most of the time and I sing sometimes on my shows. So I have to make sure that I can plug my guitar and a vocal mic into the, into the system. So tonight I'm using a wireless microphone, which you can use on stage, but usually I've got, you know, a nice stage condenser set up. And that's of course being connected through a mic cable called an XLR, usually to the system, directly to the system, and the sound engineer takes care of that. Then with my guitar, I come out with a quarter inch guitar cable, a very typical cable that everybody's used for years, and I can come out of that into preamplification and stuff like that, and my effects board, and I can send that out to the sound person who then puts it through the PA. So that's not too mysterious for most of us if we've done that with any regularity. The thing where it starts to get a little bit tricky is doing that with this new technology interface kind of thing with no audience and with no engineer and all that kind of stuff and then trying to put that out to the world digitally. So you still need the same gear. You still need your instrument. You still need your voice. You still need a microphone. You still need a way of getting your guitar sound or your instrument sound to be heard. Okay, So that much hasn't changed. So then what you need to do is, what, what, what we do when we do a live stream, is we take all that and we go into a sound mixer. Okay, so just a, a regular analog sound mixer, you know, that been, just like they've been around for decades. Okay, and then from there, you take your feed and instead of it going out to a, 
a, a set of amps and a PA. Now instead you go to what's called a sound interface. And then as far as your video goes, you, you have to have a camera that will actually stream video and you have to be able to not just record with it, but instead of recording, basically turn it into a streaming device where the video gets put out instead of being recorded on a disc inside the camcorder, it's being shot right into your computer and out into the internet. So, <clears throat> so, and then of course, to be able to do that, you need the right software as well. So you need to do this. Th there's a bunch of different ways that you can stream. What I'm going to deal with mostly tonight is how to stream to a computer. Now, of course, computers are ultimately the superior way of doing this. They have the most processing power. They have the most connectivity. Um, and they're usually faster and they can do everything a bit better than say a tablet or a phone or a smartphone. But of course you can stream using a tablet or a smartphone as well. I'm only going to allude to that later on tonight. I'm not going to talk in any depth about streaming on a phone or, uh, a, or a tablet. There are ways of doing that, that where you can actually do very high quality streams. It just it requires quite a different set of technology than we're going to deal with tonight. What we're going to deal with tonight mostly is stuff that you may have already and that you just have to augment with a few pieces of gear and the right software in order to be able to perform online. Okay. So <clears throat> what I do is uh, I have all my stage gear and then in terms of software, there's uh, a very popular software that I'll show you eventually. I'll be sharing my screen to show you some of this stuff. Um, there's a very popular software. It's open source. It's called OBS, which stands for um, Open Broadcaster Software. That's what it's called. And <clears throat> what the nice thing about OBS, again, it's free. And um, you can use it, you can get set up very quickly to do a live stream as, lo as long as you have the gear together. And you can stream to your Facebook page, or you can stream to YouTube if you've got enough subscribers, or you can you can screen to you can uh, stream to Twitch or or other. Um, there's so many platforms now; it's getting hard to keep track of them all. Um, now, the only downside with OBS is that um, you really can only stream to one to one platform at a time, unless you do this other thing, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But um, also, OBS is a little, I guess maybe because it's free, it's ever so slightly clunky and junky. It's, a, it's not the easiest thing to set up in the world. Um, also, I found that uh, despite the fact that it's great that it's free and it, it made my concerts available worldwide, um, I also noticed that, for example, the, the video resolution was never quite right with it. It would, it would look okay, but I thought, I'm sure I can, I can stream better quality than that. So since then, I found uh, another solution, which I will talk about in a few minutes. All right. So what I thought we could talk about first is the camera. Okay. So this is, for a lot of us, uh, the one piece of gear we might not have. Um, musicians, of course, have been, it's, it's been incumbent on us to make videos to promote our music for years now. Um, and... Uh, First, there were, you know, the MTV era kind of videos, the high-end, really expensive videos for television. But in the last uh, 10, 15 years with YouTube and Facebook and that kind of thing, uh, we've been able to do our own videos at home and upload them for free and promote our music that way, which is fabulous. So there's a few different kinds of camera that you can use. And um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to switch to the uh, handheld camera that Brooke is holding. And I'm going to show you a little bit of gear here. I'm going to take my glasses off so I can see up close a little more easily. <laughs> okay, so what I have here, this is one example of uh, the kind of streaming camera that you could use if you wanted to. Now, uh, this is uh, what's called a DSLR camera. So that means a digital single lens uh, reflector or something like that. I can't remember what DSLR all stands for. It's something like that. And, you know, you've probably got one of these or you've seen them, you know, you've got a little screen in the back. You can see what you're doing. Otherwise, they're like a traditional camera. It's just they don't have any film in them. Everything's put on a, a disc inside instead. 
Now, the most important thing other than the camera itself for you as a streaming musician is this, okay? So this, the way that you connect to um, your computer. So now you can see I have these two little doodads here, but the one we're concerned about is this one here that my index finger is pointing at. That is called the HDMI connection. So HDMI is something that a lot of us have probably seen. If you have a digital television or a monitor that you hook up to your computer's graphics card and your graphics card has an HDMI out, you would have one of these on your computer. Okay, But this one on the camera is a lot smaller. Okay, So you can see it's it's quite small. Uh, the standard size HDMI is quite a bit bigger than that. And I'm just wondering if I have one kicking around. I don't have a cable right here, right in front of me. Oh, you know what? I do. Where's that little bucket, Brooke? Oh, it's up way up there now. Never mind. <laughs> that there are various sizes of HDMI. Okay, so this is called mini HDMI, the one on the camera, mini. And then there's also micro. Some of the newer cameras even have micro HDMI. So that's a very small. But what they do is they, they're this size on the camera because, you know, it's great that when you can have really small device connections on your handheld devices. But then on the other end, the cable goes to a full-size HDMI connector that you would see normally in the back of your computer monitor or the back of your television. So what you need to get first is a camera with an HDMI connector like this and an HDMI cable that goes from mini to standard size. All right. Now this is not the camera we use for streaming. Okay. What we do instead, I'll get Brooke to hand me the camera she's using. So what we do instead is use something like this. Okay. So this camera is actually a few years old now. Uh, this is the second one of these I've had. Um, this is an HD camera that I got probably about eight years ago. And uh, it's an HD that, that goes 1080p. So it's when the camera came out, it was kind of the, the, the highest resolution consumer camera that you could get just a few years ago. Now everybody's got 4K cameras and all this stuff. For, for internet streaming, 4K is kind of overkill right now. It probably won't be in a few years. But um, a 1080p camera is, is more than ample. It's, it's great. And you can see what we've done tonight is we've got the... There's an HDMI cable here. And if I hold it up close, you can see it's connected there to the mini HDMI connector on the camera. And then on the other end, I'll hand this back to Brooke. On the other end, it's connected down here on the floor to this little box, this little gray box, okay? So that thing, is a very important little piece of gear that I, I didn't even know about until I started doing streaming concerts. This is called a, a video capture card. All right. So what a video capture card is for, it's to take the HDMI signal, I'll switch back to this camera, it, to takes, it takes your HDMI signal from your camera and converts it into data that your computer can use to interface with the software. So that particular one I was showing you is made by a company called Blackmagic. And they make all kinds of professional quality um, video, uh, digital video stuff. Now, here's the scoop. I run a Macintosh computer. The Blackmagic stuff, uh, at least that particular interface, is, is Macintosh only. Okay, So you need what's called a, a Thunderbolt connector for it. Now, if you have a PC or an older Mac, you might be able to use a USB uh, capture card. So the capture cards that you see for, for USB are usually a little different, a little smaller. But the, uh, the ones for the uh, Macintosh, the, the Blackmagic ones are very, very good. And um, I might be able to share my screen here and show you something. Let's see here. Um, oh, um, yes, I, sh I shall in just a second. Here, um, I'll show you the uh, Blackmagic website here. And um, all right. So this is actually not the Blackmagic website, but this is a, a, a search for um, Blackmagic uh, capture cards. So the one that I, we're using is this one right here. Okay. It's called the Mini, uh, the Mini Studio, I think it's called. 
Oh, that one, that one has a different name, doesn't it? Huh? Anyway, it looks exactly the same. Ultra what is it? Ultra, Ultra Studio Mini Recorder. That's what it's called. Okay, Mini Recorder. So, um, pardon me? Uh, yeah, the website is uh, is Black Magic. Um, it's just I couldn't find this. Maybe they've discontinued this one. I don't even know because I couldn't find it on their website. But you can still buy it. So uh, what I found was uh, this particular one is available here at AV. Uh, what, the, what are they called? Uh, AVShop.ca. Really great online Canadian electronics, um, like professional electronics uh, website. Um, and you can get any kind of gear you need from them. So they have one that's from an open box. It's only two hundred and five dollars. That's about fifty bucks less than usual. Okay. Um, I was really lucky. I found my, I found mine right at the beginning of the pandemic. Everything was closed except for um, what they called essential services. And uh, and it was funny because I um, was looking around for one of these jobbies, and. I looked, you know, I thought, well, I got, I'll try Kijiji, I'll look at Facebook Marketplace or whatever. And on one of those sites, I found one in Halifax. And it was the only one I could find anywhere. And um, so I got in touch with the guy. And he says, yeah, we're on Gottagen Street. And I was thinking, what, Gottagen Street? Like that, that number on Gottagen Street, that's right around the corner from where I used to live. Because Brooke and I used to live near the corner of Gottagen and, and Young Streets in Halifax. And sure enough, it, it was a pawn shop <laughs> that sells really great stuff. They've got always got lots of good stuff. But they had one of these. I couldn't believe it. It was the only one. And I needed one so quickly because I was going to be doing a, a live stream for uh, a Chinese website. And so I thought, well, i got to do something. So they happened to find one. They happened to have one. And I think I, I bought it used for $100. So I got a, a bargoon. So thanks to that, you're actually able to see me tonight. So th these ones, like I say, are Mac only. And uh, I'll get Brooke to do the handheld again. And we'll show you again the connector on the other side. So this, um, you see the, the mini recorder name there. So you can see on the left side there, there's the HDMI in from the camera. Okay, so that's the full size HDMI connection there. Now you can see next to that, it also can take a coax cable. I don't even know what you would do with that. Maybe if you're connecting to a cable-based network. I don't know. Anyway, we're just worried about the HDMI there. You can see HDMI in on the left side. And then on the right side, there's that little Thunderbolt um, insignia. So what that is, is a Thunderbolt 2 cable. And the latest Macintosh computers use an, an update to that called Thunderbolt 3. And uh, it takes a different connector. So if you have a Macintosh computer that is between, let's say, four and seven years old, you'll have at least one Thunderbolt 2 connector on there, and that cable can go right into it, okay? Otherwise, we'll switch cameras again. Otherwise, you have to get one of these jobbies. Okay, so here, here's the cable, first of all. This is a Thunderbolt 2 cable that comes out of that uh, mini monitor, mini studio, whatever it's called, the, the Black Magic guy. Um, and you can see the connector on it. Okay, so it's a it's a special connector. It looks like um, if you have a Mac, an older Mac with um, a DVI, a mini DVI connector, it's the same footprint. Okay, so let's say you have a Mac Pro from the early 2000s. The GP the GPUs in those have um, DVI connectors like that. So um, they use the exact same connector for Thunderbolt. So the cool thing about that is if you have say a mid 2010s iMac or something that has uh, a Thunderbolt connector on the back. You can use it as a DV, uh, as a as a external monitor connector, which is cool. Um, so same footprint. Anyway, and then to connect to a, a modern Mac, you need uh, one of these guys. Unfortunately, so you a lot of trips to the Apple Store, <laughs> where you can just I ordered these online from the Apple Store at the beginning of the pandemic. So got myself a Thunderbolt two connect uh, Thunderbolt two cable. And then the dongle here. So what it does is it converts the Thunderbolt 2 connector there to the newer one, which is called Thunderbolt 3, which looks exactly the same as USB-C, same footprint. It's also compatible with any USB-C device. So you just connect them like that. And so this end goes into that black magic box, if you have one of those. And this end goes into your computer. And then you are connected, okay? So, 
what you can do at that point is you can take any software that will run your HDMI signal and voila, it should show up on your screen. Should being the operative word. What you'll always find is the first couple of times you do a live stream, there's always a lot of, oh, it's not working. Ah. And <laughs> a couple of times I had live streams that just, I sort of finally got everything just lined up like 30 seconds before the stream was supposed to start. Always a bit of a panic. All right. Um, at this point, since we talked a, bit, a little bit about gear now, uh, maybe what we'll do is we'll take a look at the various screens in this room and uh, we'll see if people have any uh, really uh, crazy questions about here. Uh, let's see, great. Oh, good. Don Alder says the, the audio sounds really good. That's great. And the video is not bad. Awesome. Um, good. Bonsoir, Jean-François. Uh, let's see. Hi, Brazil, North Carolina, Austria. Everybody's there everywhere. Um, you see any, any questions on there, Brooke? Not a whole lot of questions, just a lot of hellos. Um, although there was one question from a fellow named Rob. I'm sorry, the name. Da, 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 da. And anyway, he was wondering about the actual piece of equipment behind you on the stand. Oh, this thing over here. <laughs> yeah, the Roland. <laughs> they don't make those anymore, which, which is too bad. I mean, I they probably make something like it, but uh, Roland... Um, it's one of their virtual instrument lines. So they have, they make V drums and they make a V guitar. That's what that is. And they make all these virtual instruments. Anyway, what it is, it's uh, you can take um, like a MIDI guitar. I think you can even do it with a regular guitar, but I've never tried it. Um, and you can drive that thing and it's got about 300 different guitar samples in it or emulations. So you can uh, make it sound like a Strat, you can make it sound like a Tele, you can make it sound like a, a you know, wicked heavy metal baritone guitar. There's even settings for sitar and banjo and 12 string and ukulele and you, you name it, it's all on there. So um, some of the sounds are, are, are scary, they're so good. Like uh, there's a 335 sound on there that's ridiculous. So I have um, a MIDI guitar, I don't know if you can see it over my shoulder. It's that skinny little instrument right there, made by Frank Crocker, it was right there, uh, made by Frank Crocker over in Germany. And it's got a, a, a MIDI pickup in it. Yeah, there it is. So it's called a, a Frameworks guitar. And uh, I use it to, to drive that thing. Let's see, which way is it? There we go. So this is the MIDI out here. And it's a special MIDI connector uh, that connects to the special MIDI connector on there. It's not, it's not a standard MIDI. It's uh, got more pins on it. So I don't know. That means it's more magical, I guess. But uh, it's cool. Also, I can go through it. I can take a, a standard MIDI cable out of it and go through it into my digital audio workstation to fire all my symphonic libraries. So I just did a, a symphonic <coughs> uh, score where um, I really wanted, I wanted there to be, it was a very African sounding thing and I wanted to have harp in it and I wanted it to sound a bit like Kora, Kora harp, the African harp. So I, I played this part into the, on that guitar, but I used a harp sample. And uh, so I was able to control the nuances really well, and it, it really worked. And uh, sometimes, too, I even uh, play something using that guitar. I just played into, say, a piano sample, and then I used that as a basis of an orchestration. But I also compose on this keyboard that's over here as well. Anyway, great. I've got another couple questions. Yes, more questions. Yeah. Um... So no alcohol, no alcohol, <laughs> alcohol free. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Driving sober tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, Blues Daddy B was asking, can you plug an HDMI from the camera into an HDMI port on a Mac? Um, the HDMI port on a Mac is really an out. Uh, if it's an older Mac that has an HDMI port, it's for connecting to a monitor. So... Uh, I would say almost definitely no, um, because yeah, that's not what really what it was designed for. So you really need an interface. That's the kind of the whole thing. It's uh, that's an unavoidable little bit of gear that you need to get. If you're a PC user, there are other ones. Um, I'll show you quickly uh, on my screen here. Here's one that most people with PCs use. And um, there we go. It's made by a company called Elgato, the cat. 
And um, this particular one that I've got on the screen right now is for streaming at 60 frames a second, which is very good. Um, you know, uh, most video that you see uh, is streaming at 30 or even 25 sometimes. But 60 frames gives you that extra bit of realism. Um, whether or not it'll translate in a stream is debatable. It really depends on so many things. It depends not only on how fast your connection going out is, but how fast people's connection is coming in. Uh, I have a high speed connection here in the studio. It's a gigabit, but that's gigabit in, you know, when I, when I send stuff out, it's only going out at like maybe 10 or 15 megabits. So, uh, it's the, which is great. It's nice. It's fast, but it's, it would be great if it was a gigabit in each direction, but for those you usually need to spend a lot of money. Um, good. Uh, one more question. Uh, and then yeah. We'll, keep got, going. well, that was, you just answered a, um, a point that, uh, Ryan Cook was asking about, uh, have you tried using the Camlink USB capture card by Elgato? And that's what you just talked about? Yeah, I, I talked about one mm. of their one of their USB ones. Okay. Um, and I'm sure there are USB-based uh, um, capture cards that will work on a Mac. But since I use a Thunderbolt Mac, I kind of figured, well, uh, may as well sort of keep it in the highest uh, throughput possibility. Uh, Thunderbolt 1, I think, is 10 gigabits. Uh, Thunderbolt 2 is 20. And Thunderbolt 3 is 40. But I've never even had a Thunderbolt <laughs> uh, 3 peripheral that, you know, that actually goes that fast. I think the fastest thing I have is Thunderbolt 2. So um, anyway, great. Thanks for the questions. I'll uh, move on for a few minutes, and then we'll take more questions. All right. So um, HDMI output. HDMI cable that goes mini to standard, the video capture card, okay, super important. Um, and you could, that could be one of those ones for Thunderbolt or a USB one, depending on your connectivity on your computer, okay? So, um, and again, again, you know, it depends, like technology changes so quickly. And with, uh, on the Macintosh side, for sure, I mean, the connectors all disappeared and everything's Thunderbolt 3, so, Everything has to, I mean, the nice thing about Thunderbolt 3 is that it's compatible with everything. I mean, everything you can think of, uh, USB-C, US, all the USBs, all the firewires. Um, you can get a dongle that'll connect your Ethernet. You can get a dongle that'll connect your sound interface, your HDMI ports, uh, your power. Uh, the list goes on. I sometimes have nine peripherals uh, plugged into four uh, Thunderbolt 3 ports, so that's kind of ridiculous. Okay. Um, then blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of the, the, the summary of what you need on the video side. Okay. The camera, HDMI cable, and the video capture card going into your, uh, computer. And again, it depends on how your computer connects. Great. All right. Let's talk about the audio. Now, um, the audio is, uh, basically what we're doing tonight. We're, we're using very standard audio stuff, right? And very standard audio everything. And then there's one very crucial piece of equipment that is the computery part, okay, that you need to have as well. All right, so maybe Brooke will get you to grab the, the uh, camera again, if you don't mind. Oh, I have too many jobs. I have far too many jobs, I know, I work her so hard. Um, so what we'll do is we'll, Take a look over here next to my uh, near beer. I've got a couple of things to look at. All right, maybe if you want to walk over there, maybe it's easier to get a shot of that. Yeah. Oh, there, there she is. Okay, great. Okay, so what I have here, uh, this is a 12-channel mixer. So this is a relatively large mixer for... Uh, solo performers or people who don't uh, have tons of gear. But I find um, for my multi-guitar shows, I really needed one. So I got one. I use it uh, to connect multiple guitars and then put them all through my one set of effects. Um, so you don't necessarily need one this big. You could use one, say, this big. Okay. So this is a, also a Mackie mixer. So this one's a 12-channel. This one's a 4-channel. So what it means is it's, it's got, you know, two mono inputs for either microphones or instruments up here. 
Um, and it's also got a stereo input. So if you're doing like a stereo keyboard or uh, even if you're coming out with your stereo effects and you want them in there, it'll, it'll send them in and out in stereo, which is really cool for such an itty bitty little mixer, right? Brooke and I ended up accumulating lots of these. We had two for North American touring and two for European touring that just sat at our manager's place in Germany <laughs> with uh, the dedicated European power supplies and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so just a typical mixer. It can be something as itty bitty as the four channel or something as elaborate as this 12 channel, okay? And then what you do is you, you come out with your regular quarter inch cables, okay? Out of the output on your mixer into this guy over here. Now, this is an example, one example of, you know, many that are available on the market. This particular one, as you can see on the top, is made by a company called Focusrite. They're a British audio company and they make amazing stuff. And um, they've been making preamps and all that kind of stuff for many years, famous for those. But in recent years, they've become even more famous for their audio interfaces. And I have a couple of them in the studio. This is the more simple one. I use this one for streaming because streaming, basically, you just need something that'll take a couple of channels, mixed channels in, and then send them to the computer. So you can see whenever I say anything, the little green light for channel one is going on and off because that's the channel that this wireless microphone is going into. And then channel two is the one that is for Brooke's voice when she gets on her mic over on the other side of the studio for taking your comments and questions. Right. So tonight I just have two vocal mics in there. What I could do is I could come out of the mixer and then go quarter inch into these because these have both, right? These little inputs will take a microphone XLR or they will take a quarter inch instrument cable and Bob's your uncle. All right. And something simple like this also has little switches on it for phantom power. So if you have condenser microphones that need power to run, you can send power to them through the XLR cable. And I'm monitoring myself tonight with the headphone output right here. Okay, and it has its own little, sorry, it's awkward. Uh, its own little, its own little uh, volume here. So that's my headphone volume. And if I were running to speakers, uh, if I needed to hear myself, that's what this is for. So this is a really simple unit, okay? And the way it connects to your computer is through kind of an old school USB cable. And I thought I had an extra one pulled out, but um, here, I'll just show you the back of this guy. So it's that kind of USB, the sort of device cable that uh, you used to see on printers and stuff like that. Now, um, this is USB 2.0, which is fast enough for audio. A lot of people fret about, oh, it's gotta be higher than that, but no. Um, 2.0 has a throughput of, uh, I believe it's five gigabits, something like that, or maybe it's not quite five gigabits. It's a lot, anyway, enough for, for audio, it's great. You could run tons of channels just on that, all right? And so that, in, this, in the case of this computer, here's the rest of the cable here, the USB cable. And then I'm connecting it through a little dongle, okay? So this is one of these um, guys that you need for one of the new Macintoshes, okay? So it goes from uh, old school USB to new school USB through there, okay? And that's really simple. In fact, as most audio video things go, you know, uh, the video is a little more complicated than the audio. But what you basically need is you need uh, a digital, a way of turning your, your, your audio into digital, digital information. And then you need a way of turning your HDMI output from your camera into digital information so that your computer can know what the heck to do with it, all right? So that's a very simple interface that I use. Uh, Brooke, if I can ask you to go over here and show that little pile of gear there under the lamp, you can see the, the bottom one of those is a more sophisticated uh, Focusrite interface that I use for multi-channel recording here most of the time. So it's an, it can take 18 inputs. And I know it doesn't look like that many, but it's only four in the front. It can take four analog inputs in the, in the front, and then there's another four analog inputs in the back, and then there's uh, eight, um, there's a light pipe for another eight channel digital input, and then there's SPIDA for another two channels of, of digital, so for a total of 18. And uh, it's an awesome um, interface. That one's called the, the Claret 4 Pre, I believe. 
and that's a, a 90s era dat machine on top of it just to be hilarious mm -hmm. and on top of that is my very nice mic preamp anyway um so these are just different ways of getting of connecting to your computer some are more elaborate than others okay and i'll go back to the other camera now all right so those are examples of of audio interfaces that you can use like i say probably for streaming the simpler the better okay because um streaming is already a bit of a headache getting set up so if you can keep your interface um, your audio interface as simple as possible it, it means that that many fewer headaches down the road okay great so these interfaces are also used for um, sending stuff to digital audio workstations so like pro tools garage band logic cubase digital performer uh, reaper the list goes on okay um, you can use these guys to uh, connect to those as well of course um, and there's even ways if you're really ingenious of uh, putting your audio into your daw and then stream that but that's <laughs> that's more trouble than it's worth anyway great how about we stop there with the audio and see if there are questions <clears throat> so yeah a couple questions here um lanza martinita would like to know if you could just recap what the 1080 camera is that you've got yes yeah, this one over here is um it's a few years old i don't even know if they make them anymore it's made by panasonic whoops let's see if i can get that in the camera without going always, <coughs> always working backwards business um it's a panasonic this particular one is an hdc tm90 um it's a five megapixel digital camera um it does a nice job it's nowhere near the latest thing i've had this one for pr i think i brought it i bought it in like 2012 this one and before that i had the earlier version of it for many years um and it was basically the same camera um uh, but it just eventually i think i dropped it too many times <laughs> but uh back when i bought these they were about 800 dollars. i'm sure you can get one for 50 bucks now <laughs> on ebay um but the, it does a great job i stream all my concerts with it and um it's uh it's kind of these days considered older technology but it works still so you know like a lot of people are using eight-year-old computers it's no big deal it's basically a computer with a lens on it you know so um that's what that camera was this uh, dslr if you're interested is um it's a nikon uh it's a little newer i probably bought it four or five years ago and um it will only go up to 1080p as well so it doesn't do uh super high end um so I, when when um, brooke and i make instructional videos for our new website that's going to be online as soon as we get some more content done it's a, a huge process but we've been shooting a lot of it on this and a lot of it on the on the hd camera that i just held up this one does uh, a slightly slicker looking job um, and on both machines you can record up to 1080p and up to 60 frames a second so um if you look at my uh youtube video for catherine i did a lot of that on that camera and um the one I did, the version I did last year. Also, my uh, Christmas time is here. It's a cover of the the song from the Charlie Brown Christmas special. Uh, that was the first thing I, I shot on this actually, and uh, it looks really good. I mean, the the 60p 60 frame thing was kind of a revelation when it happened. Um, other questions? Uh, yeah, there's a couple here. So Jay Darrow was wondering if you have used uh, Control Labs, uh, sorry, Streamlab con controller. I have not, okay. and I don't even know what that is. <laughs> okay, <laughs> he says it's used. He's used one before, and it's super convenient. So Great. maybe Jay Darrow, if you are still listening, if you could just clarify in the comments here um, for all of us what Streamlab controller is and how you've used it and how it's helped you, that would probably be awesome. Yeah. Um, so thanks for that. And uh, in a little while too, I'll show you another piece of technology I just found out about that I might get. Uh, I just haven't gotten it yet. And it's dirt cheap. It looks really good. 
and it's made for streaming. Anyway, we'll talk cool. about that in a few minutes. And uh, Curtis Thorpe was actually wondering, he's seen some of the USB capture cards on Amazon for about 30 bucks and wondering if they're kind of trash or if there's a better quality to look out for and how to look out for good quality. I, I would imagine it's like most things, you kind of get what you pay for. Probably the, the cheaper ones will only, they might only stream up to 720p. You're going to have to check that out. Um, 720p, of course, was HD up until, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe um a lot of the the early hd televisions and, and monitors were 720 and um these days they look uh pretty dated because they look fuzzy um 1080p instead of took over um and i've got a lot of 1080p monitors in my studio and they they work fine there's nothing wrong with them uh they'll they'll, they'll certainly do for now and of course more recently, you've got 4K and the, the, the new IMAX have 5K screens and there's 8K televisions and there's even 12K cameras now. It's getting <laughs> crazy. Um, but what tends to happen is that for stuff like this, for streaming, which is really relatively low-fi on the video side, um, older technology works just fine. I don't know if something that inexpensive, you'd really have to check the specs on it. Yeah, I've, those Elgato ones that I showed you earlier have a really good reputation. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, Brooke? there's a question here about miking guitars. So if you're doing a live show, or if you're doing a concert streaming, um, uh, Martin Richard would like to know more about your mic preferences and the positions you prefer when you're actually performing the guitar when you're, you know, doing a live stream. Thanks, Martin. Um, I would say especially since you can actually get pretty good audio on a stream. Um, I would say go for the best microphone you can afford or that you have kicking around. Um, I have a bunch of mics here in the studio. I haven't bought a mic in a long time. I have nice ones that I still really like. So um, I would probably use a, if I could, uh, if I felt like setting up a microphone, I would probably use a large diaphragm condenser on the guitar and then it would sound great. Um, Streaming in stereo is more difficult than streaming in mono. Uh, it doesn't always seem to work. So I would just stream in mono with one really good microphone. That's what I would do. Um, what I tend to do most of the time when I stream, as I do the same thing that I do when I play live, which is I use my K&K &K systems in my guitars. It's a microphone mm -hmm. and a pickup inside, and Brooke does the same thing. And they sound really good plugged in. So... Uh, they don't sound all frappy and slappy like just a piezo usually does. So uh, you get good audio quality, um, even without having to use a giant microphone. Um, it would be nice for a streaming thing also to try to position the microphone so that it wasn't just like in your face in front of the camera, uh, if it could be over to the side a little bit. I mean, a nice position for a single microphone anyway is sort of somewhere around near the bridge, and you can have it sort of pointing like a single microphone usually, if the guitar is like this, let's say the sound hole's here, and the microphone is kind of pointing in from the corner here like that, you usually get nice, nice results. Thanks for the question. All right, we should probably tackle the, the uh, uh, awful uh, software uh, thing. So software is actually the biggest pain about streaming. Um, but that said, I have found something that's less of a pain um, unfortunately, the, the thing I found that's less of a pain is Mac only, but I'm sure there are very good clients that will do PC as well, or Linux or whatever else you're using. Okay, so the most ubiquitous streaming software is called OBS. I m mentioned it earlier. Okay, so uh, Open Broadcaster Software. I believe that's what it stands for. Is that what I said? I've got notes in front of me. OBS, uh, yeah. Yeah, I thought it stood for that. Now, uh, it's become ubiquitous, of course, because it's free. It's open source, so uh, everybody kind of feels like, let's just you know work on this together, and, and that's great. Um, and it's what I used for my first several streams, and it worked fine. Uh, setting it up was a little bit tricky, and I find that the it, it's still, even though I still have it on my computer and I could use it, I still find it a little bit not as intuitive as what I've gotten to use. But uh, it will work for you, and, uh, and it's great. Now, the thing about OBS is that um, on its own, you can only stream to one uh, platform at a time. So you have to make a decision. You're going to stream to Facebook Live. Great. Terrific. It'll work. It'll work fine. Uh, it's just if you're streaming to Facebook, you don't necessarily be able to stream to YouTube. 
or to Twitch or whatever else. The only way to do that is to set up an account with something called Restream. And uh, did I get that name right? I'm just going to double check that because uh, I have I have a, a client with them and I just don't want to screw that up. I'm pretty sure it's called Restream. In fact, it should be on the, should be on the screen uh, if you're watching this online. Let's see if I can find it. Usually it says somewhere, maybe on YouTube, it says powered by Restream.io in the comments. Do you want me to do an infomercial type? Thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, the Thigh Master Restream. Brought to uh, you by Restream. <laughs> anyway, I believe it's called Restream. The, sorry, Restream, if I'm screwing up your name. Um, but what Restream does is... Uh, It'll take whatever feed you're sending through OBS or any other client that you set up with it, and it'll take it, and then it'll split it up to a whole bunch of different platforms. And they say you can send it to like 30 different platforms at once. I have not tried that. Tonight we're doing three. So, and that's uh, the three streams that we've got going are because we have a Restream account. Costs a few bucks a month. It's not super expensive. And uh, that's a way to stream to broadcast to a much wider audience that's a good thing to have because there are you know of course what is it now how many people are in the world seven eight billion something like three or four billion of them have facebook accounts okay so uh facebook is obviously a giant audience that's worth trying to tap into but also lots of people for very good reasons which i think a lot of us also understand avoid social media like the plague so <laughs> they would rather just watch it on youtube because you can you know just uh, be pretty chill with youtube and not have to give them too much information so um so tonight we're streaming on youtube as well <clears throat> and so restream allows you to do that you can go for you can get the people who are uh social media averse as well as those who have accounts okay so restream and um obs could be one way of going now let's look at, with more detail at OBS. Um, first of all, let me see if I can uh, get it set up on my on my screen share. Only because, like, uh, I'm, uh, the only the reason I'm saying, "Oh, let's see if it'll work," is because uh, I'm just afraid that it'll interfere somehow with um, what we've got going here. But I don't think it will. Here, you should be able to see right now. Um, should be able to see yeah, the uh, OBS window on your screen. So now what this is, uh, this is the, the main screen that you see. Uh, right now there's just a big black screen because we're not sending any video to it. And um, there's also, we're not sending any audio to it. So what I've got over here, these are called scenes, which we won't deal with right now. But under here, under sources, this is where you set up your devices for streaming. So um, what you have to do is you have to pick a video source and an audio source. Now, I'm not connected to OBS right now, so I'm not going to be able to show you exactly how to do this. But if you were to do it, it's relatively simple. Um, you click on here to connect your video capture device. And then you click also <coughs> in here, usually an audio device comes up as well. And then it'll find your audio device if it's connected. It'll find your cam it'll find your webcam first. Then you have to sort of tell it to look for your uh, video capture card. And then once it finds it, it puts it, it puts the, the image comes up here. And then you, you, your audio, you can start seeing the readout here. So what you do first, and this is the part where you maybe have to pay a lot of attention because this is where it gets a little bit complicated. But um, once you get your OBS open like this, okay, what you have to do is you have to say, okay, where do I want to stream to? Well, if you're streaming to Facebook, I'll just do Facebook as an example because it's what a lot of people do and it's straightforward, okay? So in Facebook, what I'll do is I'll go back into my browser yeah, now, got that, that's just, okay, just gonna bear with me here. Okay, let's say, uh, I'll just go to my Facebook. Here we are, so we're in my Facebook. And let's say, I mean, I wouldn't do this normally because this is my uh, personal profile, but you can do it for your personal profile if you want. I usually uh, stream to my fan page. so. Right now, what they've done on this new version of Facebook, which is very convenient, 
is there's this button right here, right away, called Live Video. Okay, So you can stream really quickly now. You don't have to go poking all over the site for um, the right spot. It used to be very difficult to find. It was called, um, well, I think the name comes up after you click on this. Anyway, so you're going to set up a stream. You click here on this Live Video button. Okay, That button takes you to this page, which will show up in a second. Here we go. So it's called, uh, what do they call it? It's got a name. I forget. Anyway. Um, uh, studio or something, Facebook Studio or something like that. Now, to when you're using OBS, uh, don't bother using this. This is, this is to use the camera that's right in your computer. So if you're somebody who just wants to get on Facebook and say, hi, this is Fred, and I want to talk to you tonight about my favorite kinds of wood to make furniture out of, and it's you know not super crucial that you have great audio and video, then you're fine. Use the camera. But for, for something like OBS, you want to use this, the stream key. And this is the important part. Okay. So what you do is you click on the stream key, use stream key, and what it'll do is it'll bring up this next page which shows you, oh no, it's the same page, uh, live stream setup. Okay, so you go here. Now, the live stream setup has two bits of code that you need to, or two links that you need to put into OBS. The first one is called the server URL, this thing here. So it starts with these funny letters, RTMPS. That is the server URL that you need to tell OBS to go to. So what you do is you, you, you press this button to copy it. Right? Then you go back to OBS and you enter it here. What you do is in OBS, you go to the right side here to settings. This is important. Okay? So that especially the very first time you stream, this is the most crucial part. So you've copied that server URL and you press settings. And then in OBS, this comes up. So along the left side here, there's all this blurb here. But what you want, the most important thing here is the stream button. So you click there. Now, you can see that because I've streamed to Facebook before, that server URL is already there. But if it were your first time, that would not be there. And you'd click in there and you'd paste that server URL link there. All right? Now, the other thing you need is the stream key on the next line. So for that, of course, you have to go back to Facebook. Okay. So let's get that back. Find Facebook under all these windows. Here we go. And the stream key is this guy here. Right. So you copy that and you go back to good old OBS. Right here. And if it was your first time, you'd click in there and you'd paste that stream key in there. Okay. And then at that point, you press OK. So you're all set up. Basically, OBS knows where to send your signal. It knows where the server is and it knows what page it's going to send it to, basically. That's what that stream key is all about. Okay. And then what happens is when you're ready to go live, you go over here to the right and you click on this start streaming right but make sure you're make sure you're all set make sure you've got an image here okay make sure that it's and it's the right camera make sure if you've got your HDMI camera connected make sure it's that image not the low quality web camera like we're using right now okay and make sure that you're getting signal here do a little sound check and make sure that you're not going way. If I, right now, I think you're probably seeing me here in the corner. I'm covering the the edge. Oh, I think I accidentally pressed something to go live. Anyway, I don't think I don't know how I could have. Anyway, I'm trying to stay out of the red on that. All right. So that's basically how OBS works. And uh, after that, you'll be set up, and you'll be streaming to Facebook the way you want. And now you're seeing a delay of what I showed you on Facebook. That's very exciting. All right. Cool. So that is an overview of OBS. And like I say, the very first couple of times you use it, 
it's nerve wracking <laughs> and especially when you're on a schedule you're, you're streaming is supposed to start at seven and it's six minutes to seven and you're still struggling to get it connected it happens to all of us I, I don't know anybody who hasn't had a bit of a hair pulling out experience the first one or two times they use obs okay um before i talk about anything else uh, any questions about obs any questions from the other page you've got up there oh right right yeah. right right Check that and also, well. <clears throat> I think um, Paul Farmer just wanted to confirm that OBS is compatible with PCs as well. Yes. Okay. Yeah, they make cross-platform versions. I don't know if there's a Linux version, but there's definitely a PC it's, version. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, Keith Richard Weiner also wrote Mac, PC, and Linux just to confirm. So thanks, guys, for that. Okay. Um, and... Lanza Martinita was also asking, he just wrote Helix or Kemper? Question mark. Um, I don't know what the context is. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Lanza, if you could just uh, um, expand on that question, that'd be great. Um, mm -mm -mm. And uh, Ivan Strakoff, hey buddy, um, thanks for the Rock Barra, um uh, request. I think tonight we're just doing tech stuff, and tomorrow Don and I are doing um, some Q and A stuff. Yeah, Brooke as and I well. are Brooke and I are doing a concert tomorrow night. We'll probably take a few questions. Too. Yeah, and I'll try to get Rock Barra up for that show because people request it all the time. I know. I, I haven't played it in eons, mostly because it's in the world's worst guitar tuning. But anyway, I'll mm -hmm. just have a guitar set up with that tuning ready to go. <laughs> any other questions, Brooke? Not on here. Um, if you guys have any more questions, by all means. Uh, Ryan Alexander wrote yes to Rock Barra. Any other questions up on the on my page there? I don't, I'm not right now. Cool. But uh, great. All right. Okay, cool. Good conversations. There's a few people helping answer each other's questions well, as great. well. So that's, that's great. great. You guys are such, such a knowledgeable bunch. It's share the awesome. knowledge. Share the knowledge. Yeah. Ryan Alexander knows all about your thumb picks, so he's he's taking care of that lot. <laughs> Thanks, great. Ryan. You're carrying the load for us. <laughs> all right. Um, what you'll what you'll find too is that with uh, various streaming software clients, um, there's often a choice on uh, what resolution, like what how many pixels, uh, and also the frame rate. So um, my default settings in general for streaming are 1080p for higher quality. Uh, what you're looking at right now is only 720 because I'm just using my webcam for this part. But 1080p is really good. And uh, 30 frames per second. I think uh, until everybody has super high speed internet, uh, anything higher than 30 frames per second for a lot of people is just going to be uh, crashing their computers all the time. Alrighty. So we have the basic uh, lowdown on OBS. Now, um, I want to talk about two other things. One of them is the um, streaming software that I personally use for streaming our shows here uh, from our studio. Now, um, like I said, I was using, I used OBS for the first two or three uh, live streams I did, but um, I'm, a, I'm constantly, I mean, I'm an MA student this year, so basically research is my middle name. So I'm always looking stuff up. I'm always trying to learn how to do stuff better, especially with technology because my life is so dependent on them these days, on it these days. So um, I started looking around for tips on streaming uh, near the beginning of the pandemic. I found a couple of really good, um, really good channels on YouTube. Um, one of them is, I don't have her stuff up right now. She calls herself Live Gal. Um, she's got an amazing channel where she tells you all about cameras and everything else and how to stream and blah, blah, blah. She's great. Um, so Live Gal is worth checking out. And then, um, uh, through LiveGal and through a few other people that I checked on YouTube, I found out about a streaming software for the Mac only, unfortunately. So for PC users, you can just plug your ears. Um, <laughs> but Mac users have uh, the chance to use something called Ecamm. So it's spelled E-C-A-M-M. -M. Okay, Ecamm. E-C-A-M-M. E-C-A-M-M, -M. E yeah. Ecamm Live is the name of the software. 
And uh, so what I'll do is I'll go back to screen sharing and um, you can see it here, what it looks like, what the icon looks like. Uh, you should be able to see there. You can see in the corner of the screen, hopefully. Oh no, I think my face is covering it. Anyway, it's called Ecamm. I'll just, um, it's already open, so I don't think it's, it's kind of like a, it would be like a never ending mirror if <laughs> two, two, <laughs> two mirrors looking at each other, if I tried to open it. But um, what Ecamm does, basically it does virtually the same thing as OBS. Um, and, uh, but what it does is it, uh, well, speaking of mirrors and mirrors, I'm looking at myself on Facebook, at, at myself on Facebook, at myself on Facebook. Anyway, um, what Ecamm does is it allows you to do the same things that OBS does, but at higher quality. And what it does is it has all these other little things you can do. Oh boy. I'm, I'm just, uh, I keep, uh, getting more Facebooks here on my screen. I'm not sure what's going on. Who? Where's my husband? <laughs> where, where is Don? Well, Who's the real there's Don? There's far too many of me now. Um, let me see if I can get out of this. Wow, this is weird. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, Don has entered the vortex. <laughs> um, anyway, where's my little... There it is. Okay. Boink. There. Back, <laughs> back to earth. Um, what Ecamm does is it, uh, it it has all these extra little bits on the screen where you can import things as you go. You can actually set up interviews, like live interviews with people uh, who also stream, and then you can have them on the screen with you, and you can be like a TV show going back and forth, you know, switching cameras. Um, I'm doing some camera switching tonight, which is kind of cool. Uh, the handheld camera's on its side over there on top of the printer right now. There's, there, there's the picture there. But... Uh, so <laughs> we're doing multi-camera tonight, which is great. Um, you can set up uh, countdown clocks. You can also do cool things like import video, which I will in a few minutes. Um, so then between Ecamm and Restream.io, uh, I found that I finally have a streaming solution that works really well for me. So that's what works for me as a Mac user. Uh, I'm sure there are equivalent things that you could do on the uh, PC side of things. All right. And... Um, I wanted to show you just a couple of other little, oh, just one other thing especially. And uh, it's a matter of getting the appropriate window up on my other monitor here. Um, here we go. This is, um, here, let me just get the actual page for this unit uh, up here. There's this new piece of technology, which I think is really cool. And uh, I really want to get it because I think it'll, um, probably simplify things, I hope. Yeah, that's the idea. So there's this company um, that makes the thing called the iRig. So iRig is, um, they were kind of the pioneers when uh, the iPad and the iPhone came out. Well, especially when the iPhone came out, because it came out first. Um, they created ways to interface between your instruments and a phone directly. And um, so you could play, say, uh, through an amplifier emulation on your phone. And then if you wanted to, you could come out of the thing as well into um, your digital audio workstation or whatever, or into an amplifier, a real amplifier. But it, let's say you wanted like a certain kind of, you wanted a tweed amp that's overdriven or whatever, and you go through this little thing on your phone and it would give you the sound in your guitar and it was kind of amazing. So they still do all that stuff. But here, I'm going to show you this... Uh, this thing on their website, this thing here is called an iRig stream. And this looks really intriguing to me. I don't have one, but it looks extremely intriguing to me. It's, uh, it's really, it's this little guy here. I'm trying to circle around here. If you can see my cursor, I don't know if you can, but uh, right below the picture of the person on the tablet there, there's this little thing with a big knob in the middle of it. Well, that is the iRig stream. And there's a really entertaining uh, video made by um, a, a total music banana, this guy here. He goes by the name of uh, Molten Music Technology. And this is a really great video where he uh, demos the iRig stream. If you want to get a chance to check this out, it's really awesome. So Molten Music Technology, you can see it down here. Uh, this is a beautiful video where he talks about the iRig stream. And, um, and he's, a, he's a real card. He's got a great UK sense of humor. But what it does is it, it, it can take your um, 
thing that you want to stream your audio and uh, it'll take it right from whatever gear you want to plug into it. Plus you can mix in other audio from other sources. So let's say, let's say you're a podcaster and you wanted to uh, do a video podcast. So you have your camera set up, you've got me talking, blah, blah, blah. And in the background, I could be mixing in my music. You know, I could say, well, you know, I remember when I wrote this tune, yada, 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 all that kind of stuff. And what this little gear, this little piece of gear does is it basically, it um, replaces a lot of the, the bigger gear um, and it replaces the audio interface. So that's really cool. So, um, and they're, I can't believe how inexpensive they are. They're like, I don't know, in Canadian dollars, they're like less than 150 bucks, which is insane because an audio interface, the cheapest ones you can get are 200 bucks to no, 300 bucks. So uh, iRig Stream, worth checking out. Um, and also watch this video because it's a lot of fun. All right, cool. All right, Brooke, any questions at this point? We're pretty much, uh, we've covered most of the points we need to, to cover, I think. Yeah, so I just, maybe one more question from Dave Semple. Uh, he asks if there's a price to Ecamm or and also, do you have Pro, P-R-O? Yeah, uh, Ecamm is not free. Um, I think there's a there's maybe a stripped down version that is a trial version that you can use. Um, yeah, I think that's how it works with Ecamm. If I'm, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, I can't remember. I think you can try Pro for free for a week or something like that, mm -hmm. and then you kind of have to commit. So I just went ahead and got the Pro version. It's not expensive. Um, it's a few bucks a month, and between that and Restream, it was kind of like all the headaches went away. Uh, it was so much easier to connect to than OBS. And um, so like for tonight, after I got all my gear set up, I just opened um, Ecamm and there was a big button on the bottom that said, go live. That was it. <laughs> I just go, and I, I made one change to add one more uh, platform to, cause to, to go to Brooks uh, page as well for tonight. So it was like so easy. Yeah. So it's a good one. Uh, other questions? Uh, maybe just for the sake of wrapping up, like having a kind of a recap, you want to just talk about the basic equipment you need, uh, just maybe just to go list through the things we talked about. Great. Okay. So for on the video side, you can use either something like this, which is an HD camera, a camcorder. Okay. Works great. You can use a DSLR camera like this. Now the, with DSLRs, it's a little more finicky. Uh, you have to make sure that you get one that will stream easily enough for you. I can't really stream with this one. I mean, I could, but the problem with it is that um, it runs on a rechargeable battery, which is great for the environment. But um, what it means is that um, I can't really uh, run it on an external power supply. So if the battery ran out in the middle of a stream, that would really suck. So. I don't use it for streaming, although I could in a limited way, I suppose. But there are other um, more expensive DSLR cameras that uh, will allow you to do all that, and they run on power supplies, and it's all good. You know, Th This I bought mostly just for making videos for YouTube, and it does an amazing job, but um, not the best streaming camera. But there are other DSLR cameras that are good. Okay, But like I say, one of these works. Um, on the audio side... Um, I'll get Brooke to do the handheld again. Oh, sorry, I'm still on the video side. You need the uh, HD, here, I'll turn the other camera on. Sorry about that. Um, you need the HDMI cable coming out of your camera, connecting to this uh, video capture card, okay? This is just one example, but this one works really well. But unfortunately, this one is Macintosh only, all right? So it takes your HDMI in on the left side, comes out here, Thunderbolt um, 2 on the other side. Okay, so you need a Thunderbolt 2 cable. It's a slightly old school cable now. You need to get it at the Apple Store. It's kind of the only place you'll find one. And that connects here to this dongle. And that dongle converts it from Thunderbolt 2 to Thunderbolt 3. And then I connect to my computer. So that's the uh, video in. Then on the audio side, um, we go through a mixer, just a, a regular analog mixer. Um, out of the output to a sound interface, okay, audio interface. And like I say, this is a very inexpensive, very sim simple one from Focusrite, and, but you need one, OK? 
you need an audio interface to do this properly, right? So capture card, audio interface, those are the two things that bring your signal to the computer. This particular one connects USB 2 and very simple USB cable. And then I have to, for my Macintosh, I have to get another dongle to go in the Thunderbolt 3 input. And uh, there's your audio and your video. And then for software, like I say, um, you have a choice, but uh, OBS is the free um, open source version. And then there's other paid products that are a little higher end and a little more capable. Uh, so you may want to consider those if you're going to be streaming on a regular basis. And um, I'm almost through my master's degree, another couple of months of it, but uh, I'm planning to stream concerts uh, on a very regular basis. I mean, it's been uh, semi-regular <laughs> since the pandemic started. Brooke and I have done two or three together, and uh, I've done three or four on my own. Plus, we've done these Q&As, and... Um, and it's great. It's a great way to connect with all you guys. But um, uh, seeing how there's no end in sight for this uh, uh, stupid pandemic, uh, obviously it's going to be something that we'll have to do regularly. Um, just for fun, what the heck, eh? I hope this works. I've never tried this before. I'm going to show you a video of my latest homework. Wait. No? I oh. have one more question. One more question, then. Two more questions. Two more questions, sure. <laughs> I would have come back for more questions, but I just thought I'd throw it in there for fun. But what are your questions? Oh, uh, Paul Farmer wants to know, what's the different What's the different use of a dynamic versus a condenser mics? Um, either will work for um, streaming. Dynamic microphones and condenser microphones just work in a different way. Condenser microphones require power to uh, work. And they're considered, um, because they're, uh, without getting too technical and because I, there's only so much I know about microphones, uh, condensers use power and they work differently. And they, uh, so as a result, they are a little richer sounding. They're really good for uh, studio applications. There are stage condensers. Uh, there's a stage condenser that we have that we use regularly. It's uh, a Shure Beta 87A. So the 87 is a stage condenser. And then there's um, there's one, I think it's an AKG mic, isn't that right? It's a 535, the one that Tony Bennett always uses. Um, the 87 is the one that uh, Peter Gabriel uses. That's kind of how I found out about it. So there are stage condensers that are, the thing is condensers for live are, are very, very sparkly high end and they and the, it gets dangerous sometimes. If you do any processing to it, they can feed back more easily. So condensers are better in the studio because they give you kind of a truer result. Dynamics are really uh, meant to be live microphones. But um, dynamic microphones record surprisingly well sometimes. It really depends on which one you're using. Crazy, eh? <laughs> Michael, or William Michael Power wants Excuse to know me. if a Zoom H4 or H5 has a place in your audio toolkit anywhere. No, I don't, I don't have any of those little itty-bitty... Um, uh, audio recorders. Um, my friend Callum Graham does, uh, he, and he he streams with his. So he uses it for because he, what he, he likes to do is he likes to um, these days he likes to run his effects uh, full time and then he runs them through a, a little amplifier. Uh, I think he uses the tone. What are those things called? Tone bone? No, <laughs> uh, tone wood. The tone wood amp that actually clamps on the back of your acoustic guitar, and then he uses microphones from the Zoom to capture the, the audio and he puts that on his stream it sounds great so works fine yeah um a couple more quick questions about miking um let's see what well, was one more oh now you guys are getting all <laughs> questiony all questiony <laughs> uh alex anderson would like to know what's the headset you're using for talking currently oh, okay mm -hmm. um these is actually two different units so the the microphone is a wireless microphone. It's uh, it's from the Countryman uh, company. So this particular one is a Countryman E6. Uh, many years ago, when I wanted um, a wireless microphone for stage use, I asked every sound person for months, "What's your favorite? What's your favorite?" And they all said, "Oh, the Countryman E6, the best one." So there's maybe something better now because I've had it for a long time. But who knows? It's great for this because I don't have to sit there with a microphone in front of my face. 
Um, the headphones, I just got these actually. Um, I did a, a little trade recently, a couple of these small mixers for a pair of these. These are really good ones. They're made by Bayer Dynamic and uh, they're called DT770 Pros. So they're a medium impedance set of cans. Um, the, the higher the impedance, the more power they need, which means that you can just uh, crank your volume and they're still not, so they're not terribly loud. But the more power a pair of headphones needs, the better it sounds. So these are uh, middle, uh, middle impedance. So they're uh, 250 ohms. The really high impedance ones are 600. Uh, most people use low impedance ones to listen to their phones or, or iPads or whatever, and that's fine. Uh, but this, these are a very, you know, professional thing, which uh, when you're in your studio all day checking mixes and checking where your reverb settings are and whether or not you've got good stereo separation and stuff, you need a pair of these, you know. Questions? Yes. Oh, let's see now. Aaron Michael Nedzan would like to know what microphones would you recommend for the drums? Oh, well, you know what? What's actually kind of the easiest thing to do, um, what I've done in the past anyway, is I take a, a Shure 57 for the snare drum. That is like the uh, tried and true rock and roll snare microphone that everybody's used forever. Sounds great. It's just a dynamic microphone, but it's an instrument mic, so it's meant to be driven hard by things like snare drums. So that on the snare. And then um, like some sort of decent um, condenser on the hi-hat. So a C1000, like an AKG C1000 works really well as a hi-hat microphone. Uh, for the kick drum, I always use a D112. I still have it. It's up there on that shelf. Um, that's really, it's a, it's the AKG mic that they came out with in the eighties. It's become kind of like the kick drum, uh, microphone. And, uh, it's also good for upright bass. Anything that's kind of big and thuddy like that. It's a good mic for that. And then, uh, otherwise, uh, for the toms, I, I prefer to use like a really good set of, uh, clip on mics for toms. So I, I own a set of not very great ones that are okay, but uh, I rented a really nice set a few years ago when Brooke was doing a record with a drummer, and I'm trying to remember what brand they were. Um, I think they were like Audio Technics or something. And, uh, you know, so you just you clip, the, clip them on the rim of the, of the drum, mm. and uh, they're totally out of the way. The dr drummer's not going to hit them, but you get a nice close mic sound which usually for most like rock and roll and pop music, it's what you want. And then uh, for overheads, usually a pair of 414s, a matched pair of 414s, AKG 414s. They make really great overhead microphones. Or another good overhead microphone choice is a stereo mic, like a, a, an NT4, the Rode microphone. Um, they make great overheads and they give you an XY separation. sound great. So that's usually it. Uh, mics, uh, drums always need a lot of mics. Uh, you need basically a mic per instrument that's being played. And a typical player usually has at least five or six instruments that they're playing all the time. So, yeah. Cool. Big thank you from Aaron Michael. Yeah, you're welcome. A, um, I think that's it. Great. Kind of. Yeah. Well, this has been a lot of fun. And um, uh, tomorrow night... Same time, so 7 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Atlantic, and then do the math for everywhere else. Um, Brooke and I will be doing an online concert together, probably right in this room. Usually we've been doing them out in our other little living room over here, but... The um, stu studio makes a cool set. studio is kind of intimate and fun. Um, yeah. Great. And uh, mostly because I'm just curious, plus I feel like showing off a little bit. Here's my latest homework. I'm going to see if this works. Uh, it might start in the middle, so I'll have to stop it and go back to the beginning because I was w making sure it was working earlier and I don't know if I reset it. So what this is, um, as you, just in case you don't know, uh, I've been studying orchestration this year. I'm doing, a, a, my, I'm doing an MA in one year, which is nuts, but it's kind of cool because the way things worked out, I mean, it's kind of cool and not cool at the same time. Um, I decided last fall, around this time, that I would go back to school and I was looking around for um, online programs in composition. I thought, you know, it, that's definitely something you could study online if 
somebody's got their act together and done it. Turns out that um, this composer named Guy Mitchellmore, who has scored probably every piece of action animation you've ever seen, uh, <laughs> um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, he started his own online uh, composing school, like uh, orchestration for, for media, for uh, film, television. And um, then he eventually grew it to such a point where uh, he partnered up with the University of Chichester, which is a public university in Britain. It's not Trump U, it's a real university. And uh, together they offer an MA program in film and television orchestration composition. So that's what I've been studying. So the program started in January and I am supposed to graduate if I don't screw it up this January. So, um, and what it involves is it's very intense. I put in a 16 hour day yesterday scoring. It was crazy. Uh, so I was pretty fried all day today, <laughs> but, um, so I had an assignment due, but, um, so they give you all these assignments and we, we've been working in sections of the orchestra. So you learn how to write for strings really well. You learn all about brass instruments. You learn about percussion instruments. You learn about woodwinds. Um, all the all the different elements of the orchestra, and then slowly you start working in first the families and then combining them, and now we're into full orchestra. So I just did a piece uh, to picture. So what this is, it's a, a a a promo film. You can tell by the aspect ratio. It's a, it's the small you know box shape four by three. Uh, it was probably filmed in the early two thousands. Um, it's from the Kenyan government. They did a, a wildlife promotional video and. Um, guy uses it as a piece of student homework so he says take this video and put a very grand very african sounding score to it so and i do all this emulating here in my st studio with um orchestral software samples so i just picked up a new library and it's actually the bbc symphony orchestra so the you know one of the greatest broadcast orchestras in the world and it's them basically all the players in there playing their instruments recorded digitally and then you can manipulate them in your studio to sound like they're playing live. So here is this little thing and I'll see if it starts at the beginning or not. Say, here we are.
There you go. <laughs> there you go. Sorry, I didn't turn my volume back up. There we go. So that was uh, the homework I submitted at uh, 11 o'clock last night. <laughs> yeah, I woke up at 6 to finish the score, and it took me until 11 to get it done. It's like a crazy amount of work. But uh, a lot of instruments, so uh, <laughs> I guess it's the way it goes, eh, when it's a full orchestra. Okay, gang. Well, if there are any last-minute comments or questions, then we'll take them, and then we're going to sign off. How are we doing there, Brooke? We're good. I think people are just uh, sharing gratitude for uh, oh, nice. their obsession, and uh, thanks, everyone, for being involved in the conversation. And, uh, yeah, it's been awesome. Smart bunch. Smart and creative bunch. Yeah, I don't know why your mic isn't working. Oh, it's I go. turned off my mic. It's back on. <laughs> anyway, but thanks everyone for getting involved and and helping kind of unlock some of these things for each other as well. You've you've got a, a bunch of really creative folks here, so it's awesome. Yeah, nice people. Well, thanks for tuning in, everyone, and uh, thanks very much to the Fountain School for the Performing Arts at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, for sponsoring tonight's webinar. And we're going to be back tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Atlantic time, 7 o'clock uh, Eastern time. So if you're in Montreal, Toronto, New York, any of those places, 7 o'clock. And, um, and then do the math after that. And uh, so uh, enjoy watching the rest of the ridiculous presidential debate, and we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>